Thanks. Our, I'm a forest ecologist. I have been trained in plantation forestry, so I'm trained to use resources, not to protect them. But I, as a forest ecologist, I became, I have to look at the ecology and I have to look at use. So that's my background. So I want to ask you a few questions. These protected areas that you have, these list of protected species, are you happy that they're working? Can you sit back and do nothing further? Or do you have to do something about that? The question is, are there better ways of dealing with that? And so I will give you my perspective on that. I often get confronted in my work with these kind of situations. Cutting big trees in the forest, bark harvesting, firewood and charcoal production, slash and burn agriculture, fire, invasives, infrastructure development, mining, all of those kind of things. Every time I have to ask my question, is this okay or is it bad? If it's bad, how bad? Why is it bad and can it, can it recover? So what criteria do I use for that? I used this in an earlier talk this morning. Uh, if you look at that landscape, for me the better landscape is the one on the right, the African landscape where there's an integrated management of agriculture, forestry, conservation, and all of these kind of things. Very different to the, our developed society landscape. And is it good or is it bad? Which criteria are we using? So I'm saying not everything that looks good is good. Not everything that's bad is actually bad. Some of it is ecologically very good. Disturbance is for many people a bad thing, but disturbance is part of everything. Even if I do nothing, I disturb the system. So think about that. If I look at the vegetation around me, forests and woodlands, I see different kind of growth and life forms. I see different kind of bark types. I see different kind of fruit types. They all represent something of an adaptation to disturbance that's in part of that system. And remember, forests and woodlands are not museum pieces, they're very dynamic systems. And we need to understand that. If you look at all these kind of forest systems, in this picture, they all have disturbance regimes. The question is, do we understand those disturbances? And how do they determine the degree of disturbance that they uh, on the composition of the system and how it will respond to the way it, it functions and how should we then manage it. Now, we can classify disturbance in many ways, I'm not going into details of that, but it depends on whether it's at the level of individual or the landscape. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is the intensity of the disturbance. If you cut my throat, it's a disaster for me but it might not affect you at all, and in the landscape there may be no effect. So we have to think about these kind of things in many different ways, and I just use these two examples of harvesting fern, we harvest individual leaves, not the plants, and you have that kind of incorporated disturbance or non-event or disaster at different levels of how we harvest it. Same with if we're harvesting the trees. Uh, in the case of this uh, stingwood tree, the disaster is that we cut the tree, but it also is incorporated in its, its recovery, it can recover vegetatively. Sometimes it's we, us, the way that we manage, that we cause a disaster because we don't understand. Now, just a few things about this disturbance more. We, we talk about the disturbance regime, the intensity, frequency, area, and the season of effect, and it, it depends on how it how serious it is in terms of what species are we dealing with. The other part of it is there's an interaction between disturbance and the landscape. If you look at those pictures at the bottom, they're all in the same kind of landscape, but you have different, they're all natural systems. And you see differences in vegetation. Is the interaction between the, the disturbance regime in that place and the site that you have there. 
and I'll show you later on some of this. So the total diversity in a system depends on all these development stages and all the different disturbance regimes that are there. And we, if we then protect the system, we actually lose those things if we don't manage for it. And that's what you kind of have to think about. If I don't have to manage it, what criteria do I use? Whether the system I'm using is good or bad. So what I'm using is, does the system regenerate? The system or the species? I may lose one species, but I may gain another one. Which one do I like? How do I manage the system that I have everything there that I need? I use a regeneration uh, status of, of the system or the species. So I work on these kind of orange blocks that gives me an idea, is it working well or is it not? I'm not going into all the details of that. So I explore four examples for you just to show you how I think about it. The first one, we heard a lot about invasives. Everybody ah, up in arms about invasives. I use invasives because I can restore forests with them. So why? How does it work? I have to understand the fire movement in the landscape. That's a typical way that fire moves and why you have that forest patch there. That's another example in the Cathedral Peak area. Burns, jumps, burns, jumps. So where in the landscape I have forest and where do I don't have forest? Where's the fire pathways? Where the fire, fire shadow areas? If you look at the next one, also in the Drakensberg, you can see the differences in the kind of vegetation you have by the frequency of the fire that goes there in the same kind of landscape. So, if I look in the landscape in general, where are my fire pathways, and where are my fire shadow areas, where do we have replanted plantation trees, can you see they all get burnt at some stage, we have to protect them against fire. The question is, if we remove fire in the landscape, or we change the fire regime, what happens to that landscape? What happens is we have a lot of species moving in there often woody species, often invasive species. So we have large areas of invasives in areas where we change the fire regime. We change the land use management or the natural system and the natural disturbance regimes in there and we change it to something else. Now we could only invade us and we think, what are we going to do with them? I say, this kind of situation, I can manage it. I can manage it back to get my forest back if I want forest but I don't want it everywhere. What did the Working for Water program do? They cut them here, and they just perpetuate the problem. Keep on, light demanding species dominate the system. What we try to do is move it on. Follow the natural succession process to restore the area away from the invaders. What we've done here in the study, and we've done a lot of these things without experimental things. Now we doing experimental things to show that we were actually thinking right. So we have this patch in Bivriac Sophie, small patch of the forest, and then we've got this extensive area of wattle, 3.1 kilometer long, 90 hectares. And we were looking at the invasion of this wattle stand by natural forest species. The contradiction in your mind, it works if you understand what happens there? See, there's a study. The forests are up on this part, and that, the red dots, are the larger clusters, more than 10 forest species, uh, forest trees in the cluster, and the white ones are the one to three trees in the cluster. It moved the whole area of the wattle stand, and the clusters are expanding where they are. So, all what we do is we uh, manage that. In a similar way that I show here, the natural succession process from a fire in the forest, getting <coughs> the legume, the native legume developing there, and then you eventually get forest. So we can manage all of these kind of invaded plant stands in a forest environment back to forest, get rid of the invaders. Okay, the next example, and I have to rush, uh, is bark harvesting. Everybody says, that's terrible. We say we can manage it. Um, 
We did a survey in Mzumkulu, and uh, we focused on four species, the ones that are underlined in this group. And we made a survey, and we did some observations, and then we did some experiments. And we got four different types of recovery from the bark. On the left is a very good, the, the Lugani, or stinkwood. Oops. And then on the right, no recovery, Rapania. And so we have many species that fall in those different groups. The one on this one, the Prunus africana, the total tree recovers, the total bark removal and the total tree recovers. And we actually made strips in that bark recovery again. That's one part of recovery which we can manage. The other part is, if you cut Ogotia, for example, you get sprouting. If you have a dying tree, what we have to do is, we have to cut it. Now, there's again a conflict in our mind, and a conflict in the way we manage it. How can we cut a protected species? I say, if you don't cut it, it's going to die. If you cut it, it will survive through sprouting. Now, we've lost 60% of the trees that were harvested in that forest because the law enforcement people, forestry and nature conservation did not want to follow what we say, cut those trees, and we lost 60% of them. Protected species on a on different list of protection. Okay? The other one I want to take you to is the uh, wild coast. We are doing a community forest management plan in that area. We, we did a survey of what people use, a wide range of things that people use from the area. The most dominant use is for firewood and for poles for construction and medicinal plants. There are not so many medicinal plants, but you see a whole range of things that are used. The first thing that we saw when we got there preparing for the study was that the housing style changed. Only 9% of the houses are still in the digital style of pole and mud walls and of poles and thatched roofs. And most of the houses are in uh, with brick houses now, either mud bricks or cement bricks or back bricks. And you've got corrugated iron roofs and that. That had a major influence on the amount of poles that are cut from the forest. And we calculated if the 224 2,240 houses that are now in, in that area that we counted, if they were all traditional houses, that means they will every 10 years they will cut about 120,000 trees to build those houses. And now you save that because you've got better houses. That was one thing. Um, so the other part that we looked at is the, what, did people, what did people use? They used uh, Umsumbiet and Umtati, those are two major species that they use for construction, for houses and for, for fences. And now they're not using it anymore, so you see an expansion of the forest. The other thing that they use a lot is Unga, Acacia Karoo. They use it for firewood. It's a main source of firewood. Now all three of these species are lighting burning ones. They will not grow in the forest if it's protected. They grow outside. So now with this change in uh, reduced cropping, reduced animal numbers, and the reduced resource use, you have an expansion of these things. And what we do now, we work now with uh, resource user groups, poly resource user group, firewood resource user group, the grazing resource user group, and all those groups, and we develop management guidelines for each of them. Thin and prune, the stems, as, we, as I mentioned this morning, what we do, clear fell the acacia karoo in certain areas and get the fire in there, get the grassland back in some places because the grassland is suffering from this. So we have all of that recovery, and when we looked at the ecology of the system, all this expansion of the, of the so called bush encroachment, is acacia karoo moving out, forest species are shade tolerant. They move along, so you get the expansion of the forest, and that's what you see in this graph. This is the core forest. That is pure acacia karoo. And all along here, there's a gradient, a successional gradient of how forest actually moving out and getting more and more forest species, increasing diversity in the area.
but we don't want all the grassland to be lost, so we have to get into a burning program as well. Okay, the last one, our ranch, that one, I'd already talked about this morning about Myoma Woodland. Uh, between Mozambique and Tanzania, the light green and the dark green is all Myoma Woodland. They seasonally dry systems with fires. You have browsing, and I said this morning also, browsing I include fire. Fire is a non-selective browser. You have browsers as animals, insects, things like that, and also people. We are, we are using it for millennia. So there's a system going on there, and most of the trees are light demanding, one thing that we often forget about. We have a lot of resource use, a lot of subsistence, but we're moving into commercial activities. And the, the blocked areas where we have to move from subsistence to more commercial benefit, beneficial, or benefits to the people that work there. And you can see some of them already have a lot of activities where they sell what they use, what they harvest. The problem that we have is it's Im impacted by a lot of commercial development. We see that as a village and the crops fields around it, that's what we see is that village. But it's not like that. That's the resource use area of that community. And we often ignore it, governments ignore it, policy ignore it, and so we have to get that right. Because a lot of that development is outside of the area. Elsewhere is economic development. And you marginalize the people in the area, and you put bigger pressure on the resources. What we perceive is a degradation in the landscape from, from closed woodland to open woodland. Because of resource use, cropping, uh, construction material, firewood. But what we forget is the cyclical thing. Uh, there's a recovery of the system. And that's what we uh, think about. I'm going to go very quickly through this. That's what people from outside think. That's how we're going to solve the problem. Condemn slash and burn agriculture. Condemn uh, charcoal production. You substitute species. Remove the disturbance factors. Fire. Resource harvesting. And we think we can solve the problem. We don't. Um, we forget. There's a system that functions there for ages. It has all adaptations to disturbance. And it manages. And we just have to understand that and manage that system right. So what is the slash and burn agriculture and the same with charcoal production? They cut the forest. Oh, sorry. Um, they cut it there. They burn it. They grow the crops. Abandon the site after a few years because there's no productivity. Then you have recovery from the rootstocks. I sh yeah, yeah, I'll show you the rootstocks in a moment. And then you have a recovery. This stand at the bottom left is 10 years old from that natural recovery system. How it works is you have a, you have a very good system of rootstocks, of most species, and they sprout after clearing. This is the most diverse and most productive part of that system, and we consider that as degraded or deforested. And that gives us, that's a healthy woodland. You can see the diversity changes from what we consider as good system to increase diversity in a, what we consider as a bad system. And we need to think how do we manage it. It's also very productive. I'm not going all the details of it, but you can see the growth rings. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, it's actually fast growth on average, but we calculate uh, lies around one to two centimeters diameter a year which is fast. For a woodland, that's not managed at all. So we say, okay, if that is a fast growth with no intervention, can we, by selective uh, pruning and thinning, improve the system and return, and help people to maintain resource use and improve the, the condition of the forest, or the woodlands? So we do selective pruning and thinning, um, give you an idea what we do. And we do that in different development stages. Do in a very young stage, try to move out the poor stems, do some pruning. In stage two, we do more of that, more focused. In stage three, more thinning, because now we have already removed a lot of branches to get straighter stems. 
And when it comes to the mature stage, we clear fill it. And we clear fill it in confined areas, not all, all over the whole place. Because otherwise, if you don't do it, we don't get regeneration because the trees are lighting on. And in that way, we can manage the system. This is just to show you what we've done in the training by doing a, a selective pruning and thinning in a plot of 20 by 20 meters. Uh, you can see what kind of branch material did we take off for each of those plots. Those are the numbers from branches that we removed, of small poles that we removed, and in the end, the poles that are of better condition because we pruned them, we taken out the poor ones and we left with the better ones, so the better crop for the future. And if you use the free sunlight, free carbon dioxide in the air, and you use water and nutrients from the soil, next year you have a better crop. You, you can actually build on that. And that is the benefit of working this with a rural society because they easily adapt to this. Okay, so that is, so those are the things I'm just summarizing in that. I'm going to jump to the next page. So my question in the beginning, do you need to do something different to your protected area? Do you have to do something that move that species that you put on a threatened list? Can you move it off there because you've done something to manage it better? Can we change the condemnation we have of the practices understand the practices and improve on the practice, do something better with it. I think it's possible, and I think we have to look in a different way at the way that we manage our resources. Thanks.